All right, last time we started getting into validating a form, and validating a form is um, a big usage of JavaScript within web applications. The reason for that is if there's something that is, the, if there's something that's so wrong with the form that it can't possibly be processed, like some very critical piece of information is missing from it, then there's no sense sending it to the server if the server can't process it. So it's a win-win situation. We can put validation on the client side and it can catch that error, all right, and give immediate feedback to the user without the user having to wait for the request to be sent through the internet, the server get to it, and decide it can't do anything with it, and then sending some sort of response back to the client. Now again, I say that as though it's a long process, and it is long compared to how quickly the client can detect the error and pop up the message. So it's not like it's like a 20 minute thing, right? But in computer speed terms, for the client to pop up an error message happens virtually instantaneously, where there could be a little bit of lag. I, like even if, like for example, if you ever paid a bill online, sometimes you press the button to pay it, Notice that it doesn't instantaneously say that your payment has been received. It, it sits there for a while. In my case, it looks up and thinks about, does this guy have enough money to pay this bill? And yeah, I guess so. And then, and then, we'll, then they put it through. But again, there's a little bit of a lag in processing. And some of that lag is travel time. You know, it has to go through the internet to get to the server. And then some of it is processing time on the server. So we're going to start out by looking at what we did last time, and then we're going to enhance it. Now keep in mind, I thought of this today because, um, or I thought of this when I put up your next assignment, which we'll talk about uh, a bit. This relates to when you're submitting data to the server. Now, you can do client-side stuff without submitting data to the server, if it's a simple calculation. If, for example, you're calculating the, um, you know, the, the area of a rectangle, all right, that's something that could easily be done on the client side. It doesn't require looking up anything in a database. It just is a very simple, straightforward mathematical calculation. Well, in that case, we're going to do the similar thing, but we're not going to use a submit button to submit it to the server. So keep in mind, in this instance, we're talking about submitting stuff to the server. So here's the code that we had. And let's take a little bit of time reviewing it, and then we'll extend it. Let's go and run it and look at it. There's our form. There's one field. If you try to submit without that, you get an alert box. All right. Here's the code that does it. Notice, first of all, we have on the form, we have an on submit. Remember, typically, it is these events on the client side that gets the ball rolling. We've seen on click, we've seen on, I think we've seen on click, we've seen on mouse over, on mouse out, now we're seeing on submit. And on submit, we're doing this validate form function. Now the reason it's a function, and there's a few reasons why you can make a function, but this is actually several lines of code. And we could actually put these lines of code right here but that would make your web page very hard to read. That would really clutter it up. So it's better just to give it a name and then invoke the name of the function. So how do you define a function? Well, within a script tag, it's typically going to be in the head section. You say function, you give it a name. You have parentheses then if there is an argument to the function. 
an argument to the function, uh, another word for argument is parameter. And then you use these bra braces or curly brackets to indicate the start and the end of the function. In this case, we have an if statement. If this condition is true, then we're going to do this. What is the condition? Well, document get element by ID. Remember, that's going to be a workhorse. We're going to use that all the time to point to things on the screen, on the page, to look at their properties and to do stuff with them. So document get element by ID means find the thing on the page that has that ID, txt name. And it's this guy, txt name. If its value is equal to an empty string, so if nothing is put in there, then we're going to pop up an alert box and we're going to return false. The way if statements work is that you have an if and a condition. That condition is either true or false. With if statements, it's totally a binary thing. It's true or it's false. If the condition is true, then we do this. If the condition is false, then we can optionally have an else clause, which we don't in this particular case. We're popping up an alert and we're returning false. Otherwise, we return true. What does that return do? Well, return is the answer of the function, if you will. And in this case, the answer to the function is no, this, this form is not valid. So we return that answer to this, and that answer gets returned to the onSubmit method. And if we return a false to the onSubmit method, effectively we're telling it to stop the presses. We don't want to continue to submit this form. So it will stop the form from submitting and let the user correct the error. All right, let's imagine that we have a second field here. And I should probably start making this form look a little nicer. So I'm going to put these things in an unordered list. If you think about it, that's really what a form is. It's a list of values. Now, keep in mind that keep in mind what? Totally lost my train of thought. Keep in mind we only have, I think this is what I was going to say, we only have one form tag. That goes around everything that we're going to send to the server. And I'm going to style this a little bit just to review our CSS code a bit. I'm going to put labels here. Why do we have labels? What, what's the purpose of labels? Well, there's sort of the, there, there's one purpose and there's, then there's a second purpose that's kind of a consequence of it. First purpose is that this will help people that are visually impaired associate the text box with the label. In other words, people that can see, it's easy to tell what the label for a field is, right? It's the text is right next to it. But if you can't see and a screen reader is narrating you 
these fields is not always obvious to someone accessing the page that way what the label for a particular field is. So therefore, a label tag associates the label with the input field that it's associated with. I'm going to spend a minute styling this up a little bit, again, just for practice, and it will come in handy in a bit when we start doing some cool things with JavaScript. So there's our form, name, email, submit. Well, the bullet points kind of look not so good with this, so let's get rid of them. Remember, you never, style, you never put HTML code in because you want it to look a certain way. You put HTML code in because that's what it is, that's what it means. And in this case, a, le uh, a form is really a list of input boxes. So make it a list. Now if you don't like the way the list looks, fine, but that should be taken care of through style. And again, in the interest of time, I'm just going to put my style code in here. Or I'm going to put something in there. I don't know what I just typed in. And I can say UL list style type none. And that will get rid of the bullet points. While I'm at it, I'm going to I can do something like well, let's see. Um, let's say label. with 100px text align right. I didn't make that 100px, why not? Label with 100px, sure looks right, why not? What kind of tag is label? Pardon me? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Um, you are, you're in the right direction, but paragraph isn't the right analogy because you can set the width for a paragraph, all right? But you are right that, that a label is an, what's called an inline tag. In other words, inline tags just appear side by side by side, and you can't set the width for an inline tag, all right? Paragraph is a block tag, but, but everything else that you said was correct. So, if I say display... Inline block, or is it block inline? All right, there it did it. Inline block is like a magical thing. It says, you know, it still stays an inline tag, but let, let you apply properties that you can only apply to block tags, which is kind of convenient, like in this case, where I want to make the label a certain width, but I want it to remain a inline tag. So I could do um, a few more things to format this. Let me put a colon after each of these. And I could put some, um, I could put a margin, margin also being a block attribute. But because I said this is an inline, block, it gets both these, I can treat it that way. So there we go. And So, 
it. So there we have our form. Now again, this is one thing that I sort of expect in this class is that you don't have to make each page a masterpiece and beautifully designed where you're going to, when you get home, you're going to print it off and, and hang it on your refrigerator or anything. But you should take the care to do something with the appearance of it. All right, now in the interest of time in class, I won't necessarily do a lot of stuff, but it should look like a completed web page. In other words, don't just put a bunch of HTML without any sort of styling at all on it. All right, so now we're going to go, and I'm going to go, now I have two fields to validate. All right, didn't complete form. And oh, I have to put in the first field, but I have no validation for the second field, right? Of course not. I haven't written any yet. So let's go in and let's put some validation for the second form. And we could do the same thing. Now it 
tells me I'm missing the email. What don't you like about that? Yeah, it shows you the first mistake, you correct it, then it will show you the second mistake. All right? Could you imagine you had a form with 10 required fields? And, you know, I mean, you don't necessarily want to divulge information about yourself that you don't have to, so maybe you just fill in your name and email address. It tells you the phone number's missing. You put that in. Then it tells you your address is missing. Then you put that in. Then it tells you this is missing, and so on. It's better if it set, displays all the errors at once, all right? And I would also agree that it would be better to put side, right next to the message, uh, or right next to the text box, a message. So we're going to try and take care of that, okay? We're going to try and take care of that, all right? We're going to try to take care of those two things. We're going to put a message on the screen as opposed to popping up an alert. This alert, by the way, is called a modal alert because when it pops up, you can't do anything on the page. I can't get in there to change that. I can't even go up here to the browser properties. That stops the presses. And so these modal windows are, 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 aren't good, aren't a good idea. Much better instead to um, display a message. So. Let's do that one at a time. Let's first put a message on the screen, and then we'll make it so it does the entire validation and tells me everything that's wrong before it proceeds. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a span. What is a span? Necessarily. What is what tag is the span's cousin? I don't know, that's a goofy question, probably, but span and divs are cousins. Alright, why do I say they're cousins? What is a div tag? A div is a generic container. It's a division, it's a section of the page. What's that section for? We don't say. It's just a generic division, a generic section. A, a span is the same thing, except a span is an inline tag. A div comes from the block side of the family. The span comes from the inline side of the family. So a span is simply a way to designate an area on the page with an inline tag without associating any other meaning with it. Just like a div is simply a generic block tag. So I'm going to put an ID here. I'm going to call it air name. And initially, this is where I'm going to put my air message. And initially, there's nothing there, right? Because there's no air message there. I'm going to do the same thing with email. So now I have two things on the page that their only purpose is to give a spot to pop an, e, uh, an error message. All right. So I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it to if there's an error, I'm going to put Instead of popping up the alert box, I'm going to put in there a a message. Now, what did I use to do that? I used our workhorse document get element by ID to point to that span, to point to that element. It has that ID. I then use the inner HTML attribute. What is the inner 
HTML attribute represent? Well, it represents the space right here, the space between the starting tag and the ending tag. All right. Remember, when I, you know, the first couple days of classes when I was talking about the DOM, and I said with the DOM you can point to and you can manipulate anything about the page, anything about the page. All right. Well, here we're manipulating not the color of the page or whether it's visible or not. We're actually manipulating this HTML right here. We're putting in a piece of code right there. And it could be a link. It could be anything. It could be any HTML we want to put in. In our case, we simply want to put in just a little must enter name, just a little message. So the HTML we're putting in there is very simple. And I'll do this, and I'll say same thing. Must enter email. So now I click that, I get the message saying must enter name, click that, must enter name, I enter the name, tells me must enter email. Alright, I did something wrong with the positioning of those guys, right? I probably put it on the wrong LI. The span, yeah I did, I put the span with the submit button. centering of the form because I don't like that now that we're popping up the error message. Must enter name. Must enter email. Now a couple things wrong. Alright. Number one, why does it still say must enter name? Because we didn't tell it to go away. We changed the page. That page is going to look way until we change it again. All right. The other thing wrong with this is it only notices one error at a time. So again, we're sort of back to the same old thing of I type this in and click submit, then I get the error message. I go and click that. With no name, it tells me that. I enter it in and then I get the, so we have some problems, but they're easy enough to correct. How do we correct the problem of the name still, the, the name error message still being there even after we've corrected that? On the return true, he would set that in our HTML to an empty string. I could, do, I could do that there, or keeping in mind of what I'm going to do next, I'm going to put an else statement here. In other words, if there's an error, I'm going to display the message. Otherwise, I'm going to clear out that message. So the way you said was correct, I could do it that way, but again, knowing what I'm going to do next, I, I, I want to take this slightly different approach. So now we have this. The, the name's missing. I correct that. Submit. Got rid of the old error message, but again, I still have the problem of seeing the first error, correcting it, then seeing the second error. I want to see all the errors all at once. How can I fix that? How can I see all the error me uh, messages all at once? What's causing it to only display the one error message 
and then not do the second validation. Because I have two if statements. Um, not, no, I, I could get it to work with, with two if statements. So that in itself isn't changing it. What causes it to stop after the first? The return. What does return say? Return says, I am done processing this. Here is my answer. All right. So as so in this case, as soon as we find a problem, it says, I'm done. Here's your answer. This form isn't valid, which is correct, but we want to go in and do the rest of the validation to see if there's any, any other errors. So we're going to have to make a slightly different approach. What we're going to do is we're going to declare a variable to hold the answer. And then we're going to only return at the very end of the function. So we'll let all the validation happen and then we'll return. All right? Now, I'm going to assume that the form is valid until I find an error. The reason for that is for the form to be valid, everything has to be right all at the same time. For a form to be invalid, if I find one thing wrong with it, the form's invalid. So it's easier to prove that this form is invalid than it is to prove that it's valid. All right, because if it's valid, I have to check everything together. If you don't believe me, try writing the code the other way. All right, and it, it'll, it'll be messy. It'll be a little bit messy with two once you get to three or four or five form fields it'll become really messy. With this technique, it really doesn't matter how many fields you have. It doesn't really make it that much more complicated. So, I'm going to create a variable. And what is a variable? A variable is a little memory location. We're going to remember something so that we're going to, so that we can use it later. And in this case, we're calling it B valid. The B stands for Boolean, which means it's true or false. That's what a Boolean is. And I'm going to assume the form is valid. So what am I going to what other changes am I going to make to this function? I now have a variable called B valid and I set it to true. What am I going to change about this? Right. If it's not valid, I'm not going to return false. I'm going to simply set it to false. I'm going to do that there. And I'm going to do the same thing here. What's the last thing I'm going to change? Well... If it makes it through all those if statements, does it, do I know it's true? No. So I'm not going to return true. I'm going to return my variable. So think of be valid as being a little scratch pad, all right, where I'm keeping track if it's valid or not. And I assume it's, it's valid to start, so I write true on the scratch pad. I do all these checks. If I find any problem at all, I scratch off that it's true and replace that with false. When I get to the very end, my answer is whatever's on that scratch pad. Now notice that I don't set the value to true if the statement is false. If Someone did enter something in. Why is that? Why don't I set it to true there, and why don't I set it to true here? It's true by default. It's true by default. If nothing sets it to false, it'll remain true. If nothing sets it to false, it'll remain true. If one thing sets it to false, like even if I had 100 fields here, if one of those fields there's a problem with and it sets it to false, I never want to switch it back to true, right? Because if there's an error, there's an error. It doesn't matter how many things after the error are valid. There's still an error. So I never want to...
want to set it back to true. All right, let's see and make sure that this still works. Ah, we get two errors. Yay. I fix error one. Yay. I fix error two. It works. Now, again, the fact that that's not a valid email address, we're not going to worry about for now. All right. Now, I think this is a lot better than what we came in with, right? Because it tells me all the errors, and I won't be stuck with the frustrating bit of correcting one error, finding there's another error, correcting that error, finding there's another error still. Now, what else could we do visually on this screen to make the errors stand out? Again, keep in mind we simply have two fields here, but we could have 15 fields on a big form. And does anyone feel, yeah, I'm, I'm sure some of you fill out the FAFSA form, right, which is like a whole bunch of fields, right? And, you know, you certainly want, you certainly want, wouldn't want the million fields, a little error message off the side, you want it to stand out, right? What could we do to make this stand out? Make it red. We could make it red, all right? What could we do in addition to making it red? Make it in bold. Make it in bold. And why would we not want to only make it in red? In case someone's colorblind, all right? So what I could do is... I could put a class, this is error, and I could make the color red, and I could make the font weight bold. And then, can I simply go and put that class on this guy? Yeah, because all that's going to display there is an error message. If there is no error message, then the empty space will be red and bold, <laughs> all right, which means nothing, right? There's nothing there to be red and bold. So I can go and make this class equals error. There we go. Pretty nifty. Now, we could also, for further emphasis, make the label red and bold. All right? How do we do that? And before we answer, before we discuss this, keep in mind, I don't expect you to know, know the answer completely, but I expect you to kind of know part of the answer. How could we make that label red and bold if there's an error with that field? In my if statement? All right. We could, we, we have the, the, one, the one thing that um, I'll correct is you said name. You should, it is ID and not name, right? And again, the only reason I make a big deal about that is because things have names and IDs. The IDs are typically used within JavaScript, but you're right. Every label has an ID. When we check the field, we could, if there's an error, say document, Okay, the label actually doesn't have an ID, but we can give it one, right? Label name and label email. All right, I can say... Get element by ID. Label 
label name. What do I want to do next? I want to point, I'm pointing at that label. What do I want to change about it? Pardon me? Something about its style. Specifically, what about its style? The color. And I want to set it to red. Notice font weight is font dash weight. In JavaScript, when you refer to something that has a dash in it, you use the lowercase for the first word, uppercase for the subsequent word. So I can say font weight, bold. <laughs> Very good. says font name, or that says name, and it's red and it's bold. And I didn't do it to email yet, but we could. Now, what if I were to say we could do this, you guys probably don't remember, there was, there was an old TV show called Name That Tune, where you would, they'd give you a hint, and You'd, you'd bid. You could say, I could name that tune in ten notes. And then the other person, if they thought they'd know the answer, say, I could name it in seven notes. And you go back and forth, and they go name that tune. So the idea was you could do it with less. All right? What if I were to say we could do this with only one, a couple lines of code? Right now we have four lines of code. Two if it's true, two if it's false. What if I were to say we could change this to have one line of code? All right. One if one one line if it's true, one line if it's false. How would we do that? Pardon me. An array? No. We already have something on our page that was bold and red. The class. Why can't I just assign the class to it? And. What's the advantage of that? Well, number one, it's easier to write, right? It's, it's, it's one line instead of several. And what if we were doing something besides red and bold and we also change the font or we change the background or whatever? Much easier to assign a class to something than to change the attributes individually. The other thing is it keeps it consistent with this. And, and that, that's, a, a, that's a big win, too. So what I could do is I could say if there's an error class name equals error now what if it isn't well I'm going to give a, we'll create a class called normal. And we'll apply that class name if there's not an error. same thing with this. Oh, I, 
I didn't create a ID for the error label. Or did I and I just didn't use it? I did, I just didn't use it. There we go. Ooh, what's going on here? Repeat that, please. Oh, I put label error instead of label email, right. So what happened there? It ruined everything. That's why we can't have nice things, right? Ruined everything. If I didn't, if I didn't, if you weren't there to catch my error and to see that I typed in label error instead of label email, how would I go about debugging this? Stare at it. Yep, that's it. Brew a pot of coffee, stare at it until the answer came. Excellent. All right, we'll see you over in lab. No. No, we know that's not the right answer. All right. So how am I going to do this? This is an especially goofy situation because if I go and apply my troubleshooting technique of looking at the JavaScript console in Chrome, it shows me no errors because it showed me no errors for this page. And you got to go back. And there's no errors for this page until I click submit. So I'm out of luck, kind of. How can we stay on this page? So how can we stay on this page? So, um, we could see what the error is. Good thought, but we're still going to go to some other page. Even if I make that action pound sign to stay on this page, it's a new instance of pound sign. Here's what I'm going to do. Problem is, is that I'm submitting it. So how can I keep it from submitting it? I can, I don't care what this guy returns, I'm going to return false. Because returning false stops the presses and says don't go on to the next page. So now I go and I do this. Here's a good thing. There's always, there's always a way around it. I could have swore that would work, but I'm wrong. So you know what I'm going to do? I am going to make a button that is not a submit button. It's just a button. What's the difference between a button and a submit button? Pardon me? Uh, you said button's just decoration. Uh, a button is just decoration unless you put some JavaScript behind it. All right. The button, unlike the submit button, has no intrinsic behavior. In other words, a submit button, you click a submit button, it submits it to the next page. A button doesn't do anything by itself unless you write some JavaScript code. So I'm going to write some JavaScript code to call my validate function. Again, this is just debug code. I'm going to get rid of it when I'm done. All right. And now I click that. Aha. Uh -huh. I get a hint. What's the hint? That label still isn't changing. I go look at my JavaScript console and cannot set a property class name of null in line 28. Line 28 is trying to set the class name of label error. Null means
means that it doesn't exist, that is, get element by ID can't find the element, well, wait a minute, I have label error right here. Oh, no, that's label email. So I go and fix it, and I am back in business. Or mail. Now, no JavaScript errors, and... took out the return. And there we go. And now I can get rid of the little debug code. The idea is, is it takes some sort of analysis and some thought sometimes to figure out how to debug something. All right? And sometimes you have to introduce code that eventually you're going to get rid of. I remember projects I worked on where we had to simulate what would happen if the database crashed. Well, how do you write code to do that? Well, I don't know, you know. So we had to figure out a way to test it to make sure that it worked. So sometimes in testing your code and debugging it, it requires a little bit of creativity to add stuff in that eventually you're going to take out and it's just there to perform the testing and debugging function. All right, we will continue with this next time, all right, because we validated text boxes, but there's a bunch of other things, too. There's, there's radio buttons, there are drop-downs, there's check boxes, and so on. In addition, if you look at your assignment, your, your next assignment, which is, covers two weeks, um, is it going to... Um, require submitting to a server page, because we haven't studied server-side scripting yet, we are going to instead do some calculations right on the page. So we'll look at how we'll do that, and we'll try to talk that through. All right? All right. That's all I have. Time for lab.